BBC Radio 4, at 6 o'clock, the news with Corrie Caulfield. The former footballer Justin Fashionu has been found dead in a garage in East London. It's understood Fashionu, who was 37, died from strangulation, although the results of a post-mortem examination were... Justin's death was relayed to me via one of my brothers, who called me, and um, he was very hysterical at the time. So it took me a while to get my senses together, to understand what he was actually saying. And then after that, we had to make a decision. How do we tell our mother? Ashley became Britain's first million pound black player after his move from Norwich City to Nottingham Forest in 1981. But his career on the- I thought to myself, well, why doesn't he come to the point? And before he had finished what he was saying, I said to them, he's dead, isn't he? Nobody replied. I just slumped in the chair. And so, of course, they told me he hanged himself. The 37-year-old was wanted for questioning by police in the United States over allegations that he'd sexually assaulted a teenager. Fashion is life both on and off the football field. This is a film about a man who had everything, looks, talent, money, who lost it all and died alone in shame. Justin was my shining light. He was my life. He was the one who I saw as my mother and my father as I was growing up. He was my strength, he was my inspiration. He was what I idolized. John and Justin were Bernardo's boys. Their father, a Nigerian lawyer, left the family when the boys were toddlers. Their mother, a nurse, already had two other children and was unable to cope. Obviously, it was very difficult for me. I would have rather have them with me all the time. If I had, you know, the means, I would not have let them go at all. Financially, I was very, very limited indeed. It was very disheartening, but I had no alternative, no choice at all. The parting really grieved me. My first memory of Justin is um, at the Bernardo's home, being very, very close to him. I think it happens when you, you realize that you haven't got uh, um, a mum and a father who are with you. After two years at Bernardo's, John and Justin, aged four and five, went to Norfolk and foster parents, Betty and Alfred Jackson. We decided to move up to Norfolk because uh, our own children were off our hands, or more or less off our hands, and uh, we'd always wanted to live in the country. Yeah, and then when we, when we got here, we found lots of empty rooms upstairs and a large garden, and the thing to do was to bring up some more children, we thought, you see, so... We got in touch with Dr. Bernardo's, and they asked if we could face having two black children who were going to be separated, they were brothers, if they weren't fostered fairly soon. I remember that I was very insecure, and at that particular time, I had a speech impediment, and I had that for three or four years, and I was finding it very difficult to communicate. But the irony of it was that Justin knew exactly what I was saying. Consequently, Betty Jackson, who I affectionately call my white mum, would say to Justin, Justin, what's John saying? And Justin would say, well, John's saying he would like some more sweets, or he's tired, or no, John doesn't like that. So I would cling to Justin. I visited them very frequently, and when they went on holiday, they sent me cards and so forth, and um, the communication was always there. And because I was satisfied 
with the treatment that they were given. I thought it would be very silly of me to take them away from this environment because you name it, it was all there for them. I'm blessed that we found a, a lovely, lovely, caring couple who loved us like their own children. I think it's difficult if you're a black child being brought up by a, a white family. We were the only two black children in a very small village of all white people. I remember, you know, all the time explaining to all the other children why your hair was different, why your skin was different. You know, there's, there's two ways you can go. You can swim or you can sink. We chose to swim, we took the positives. We're 100 miles away from London. Um, we're 20 miles away from Norwich and we're a little village and there aren't that many coloured people anywhere around. Or at that stage there weren't any, any coloured people about. So we didn't have the problems that were going on in London at that time. Throughout his schooling, Justin was regarded as bright, though certainly not a hard worker. His real talents lay elsewhere. Justin was fantastic at sport. He was strong at running. He was strong in uh, um, football, basketball, baseball, rugby. He was a natural athlete, and he was very, very ambitious. There was never any doubt in my mind that he wouldn't become a first-class footballer. He was 13 years old when he came for the trial and uh, I was paid to do the job of work to recognise ability and that weren't too difficult to do. I mean, Justin had ability in abundance. He was mischievous, boisterous, uh, self-opinionated. He was a lad that I had to keep under my thumb a little bit because of his natural ebullience. Ronnie Brooks was like the father, not only just for Justin, but also for me. He was a very respected figure in Norwich a magistrate. He was one of the few people who could control Justin. I believe I was a father figure to Justin. And I always made the point that was my job to make sure he achieved his potential. Well, I suppose the fact that um, he hadn't had the same home life that most child, uh, children had, and I suppose that was part of the problem, um, he felt that he needed this closeness of people and uh, a relationship with people. And uh, I gave him that. I gave him that. I mean, I made a great friend of Justin. Uh, he came to me in times of stress and problems. And uh, I thought a lot of Justin. I really did. You know, I, I felt a lot of pressure trying to follow Justin. He was naturally gifted. Justin was probably the better of the two. Um, because um, he, he was strong and powerful, as in, indeed they both were. But Justin had that little bit more about him than John did. I got turned down by four or five clubs who said at the time, look, you know, sorry, you're not, you're not good enough. You're not big enough. And that was of a direct result of having a brother with the name Fashionu, because they all expected me to be as good as him. At 17, he was playing with grown men of, you know, 21, 22. My maturity would come in the early part of my 20s. Justin Fashionu made his debut for Norwich City on a January day in 1979, one month short of his 18th birthday. He was an instant success. Justin's all-round ability uh, was there to see in the two seasons that he played in our first team and scoring something like 40 goals in not a good side uh, was obvious that the boy had the makings of a first-class forward which everybody was looking for at that time. Everybody wanted a big striker, and here he was. Oh, the fashion who's through here for Norwich. It's fashion who again, and that is... At Norwich, he was sensational. He was awesome. He was like a black panther. Ryan, fashion who. Justin would shoot from the right foot, he'd shoot from the left foot. He'd hang in the air. Oh! You knew before it left his head that was a goal. Special again. He was a strong, good-looking guy. I remember sitting in the crowd watching him at matches and listening and looking at the way he excited people. All the young children wanted to emulate Justin. He had so much attention. He had everything going for him. 
I watched a few of his performances and I was extremely proud. I listened to his interviews on the radio, I saw him being interviewed on television and I was one of the proudest mothers in the world. When you see him on the field, he, he's marvellous. But it would have been nice if he'd been a scientist or a doctor or something, you know? Still, that's just the way it goes. The thing that spurs me on is the fact that I am playing for black people who maybe have not had as good a life as I've had, who have been living in the ghettos and who have had the prejudices poured up against them all this time. I think that that's good for them to show, to know that a black person can get on. I think it's a spur for them. So I think it gives them hope. You know, I, don't know, I don't know, I think it's a little bit serious, more serious than what I thought, actually. Yeah, you always say that. My relationship with Justin was just starting to change. He was starting to be very successful. He was starting to say, John, come on. You've got to work for everything. I've worked for it. You've got to work for it. Justin had now got to the position where he was so popular in Norwich, he could do anything, he could go anywhere, he could say anything. He'd park his car outside a restaurant on double yellow lines and go and have a meal and refuse to move it. And these sort of stubborn, arrogant things which he was then starting to, to get into. The only person they would call is Ronnie Brooks. It became a bit more difficult to control and look after. He'd come in with a huge bundle of parking tickets. And he said, what am I going to do with these? He said, look, they've been giving me parking tickets. And I said, well, you... He said, I tell them I'm just and fashionable. I said, they don't care who you are. If you transgress against the law, you must pay the penalty. What do you want for yourself? How do you want to see your life developing over the next 10 years or so? Um, I would like to get richer and more famous. <laughs> Being a celebrity of my age, you can have one or two of the rewards. I've got a nice car, and of course, uh, there's one or two girls that come my way. It was every day in the papers. He was being hailed as a major superstar. Everybody knowing him, everybody singing Justin's praises. You know, I'd go into school and they'd have another story about Justin scoring three goals, beating 11 men on his own and putting the ball in the back of the net. I would always be saying to Justin, come on, Justin, help me a little bit. You know, give us a little bit of money. He would never do that. I remember I would go through his suits, pockets, in the evening when he was still at training in Norwich, looking for money. I'd find five pounds in one jacket. I might find some coins or ten pounds in another jacket, and never being able to understand how somebody could lose money in their own jackets. Do you feel that there are any dangers to his stability? Well, um, there must be. I just hope that we can keep his feet on the ground and make him realise that he still has to fill the old car up for us. You know? <laughs> Hello. Will you come and fill the colour box for me, please? OK, it's coming down. What do you say? I'm not really afraid for him because he's a very balanced boy. So what do you mean? Get the colour box, please, darling. I'm sorry, it's raining. Very sensible. And he knows that this is a short-lived thing. There'll be a time when he's nobody again. I always used to think, well, what happens when this finishes? I realised it was, it was unhealthy and I was beginning to become envious. And I think from then we were starting to have a rift. Who are we going to give the money to? I'll have it. As far as the fans are concerned, I think at times they can be a bit of a hassle when you're not in a good mood and you've got a lot of people around you and they put their fingers on your car, which you've just cleaned. But I like it most of the time because it shows that you're wanted, it shows that people love you and it's something which you'll miss when you're not in the limelight. As an apprentice, Justin caught me signing autographs after a youth team match. Just some kids came up and asking for autographs. And I remember he took the pen away and snapped the pen. And he said to me, earn the right to sign your name. These children only want your name because of the success I've had. You in your own name earn the right to have them idolize you. I remember not feeling that I could go over to talk to him because he was so busy with 
PR, television, newspapers always round and things like that. He was starting to lose grasp of reality. February the 9th, 1980, a game and a goal that was to change the life of Justin Fashionu for good. Ryan Fashionu. Justin, on behalf of Match of the Day, my very great pleasure to present you with this marvellous silver salver for scoring the goal of the season. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That goal was breathtaking. It really was. And that certainly brought him to the fore as far as other clubs were concerned. Yeah, you know, John. Show it to the younger brother. Oh, it's special, that. And uh, certainly that goal changed his career and his life, unfortunately, for the worse. Justin's move to Nottingham Forest was a big move, a very, very big move. Overnight, the signing on fees were coming pouring in. Endorsements of boots and shirts and a lot of money. It became ridiculous. Spending thousands of pounds on clothes and shoes and, and it was becoming sickening. I don't know who was looking after his finance, whether he was managing it himself or somebody else was doing this for him. But he was earning his money and he had full control of it. I couldn't really intervene. I didn't feel that I was in a position to do so. Looking back, I'd lost Justin when he went off to Nottingham Forest. He lost his background. He started to believe in the publicity and the hype. And in our industry, once you believe in the hype and the publicity, you're going down fast. I had a, a phone call from this public relations manager would we as a local garage be interested in sponsoring Justin with, with, with a motor car? And I, I thought, gosh, this, he must be the hottest thing in football. And uh, I gave an inst instant decision. I said, yes, we'll, uh, we'll supply him the car. Inevitably, he chose the most expensive, flashiest model at the time. And then he said, Terry, he says, when can I have it? Can I have it quick? I think his first accident was about 10 days after the delivery. After that, he had accidents about once a fortnight. When his car came in for service one day, he, he actually had left a pay chit in the car. And uh, the, uh, the mechanics, of course, um, spotted it. And I think in those days, he was earning something like £1,900 a week. And uh, that was in 1981, so it was, he was quite well paid. Seeing somebody so close to you, being so successful, and everybody believing that you know, he's giving you all his pounds and his dollars he's making, and in actual fact giving you nothing at all, can be quite hurtful. And I just wanted, I just wanted my closeness with my brother. I just wanted him to be with me. I can see no point in you taking corners. Brian Clough, his new manager, was direct, outspoken and unforgiving. A clash with his 20-year-old centre-forward was inevitable. Get in there. That's what I pay you for. Had I have known that he was going to Nottingham Forest, I would have advised him quite strongly not to have gone there, because Brian Clough was a very um, abrasive sort of person who would not wait to put down a player if he felt he wasn't doing something he wanted him to do. I saw the beginning and the end of Justin when he moved to Nottingham Forest. The relationship which they had um, was based only on the fact that Justin would score goals and he'd do well. I think it's a time when you realise that all footballers are commodities. That finds fashion move. Well, it wouldn't just sit right for him. He came from a lovely Norwich where the people were sweet and so nice and they'd protect him. And if he missed a few shots, nobody cared because it's just in Fashionu. Fashionu wants it right side. 
and he gets it. And away off the line. Justin was on his own. And for the money he had earned, and for the tender age he was, he hadn't grown up, he hadn't matured as much as they thought he was. Unbearable pressure on him from all quarters. And he lost it. And here's Wallace and his fashion He'd only scored three goals, and um, obviously that wasn't a good return on a million pounds. I suppose Brian Slough thought, thought I'd signed a player for a million pounds, and I made a boner of it. And um, he knew that at the end of the day, the blame had got to lay at his door. So obviously he made just an escape goal. But it wasn't just his failure to score goals that was bringing Justin Fashionu unwelcome attention. He was beginning to develop other interests too. My immediate memory of Justin is that he was uh, clearly a, a very handsome young guy, um, very strikingly attractive and very friendly. He had an enormous warm smile, huge happy face. I first met him with his girlfriend, Julie, when uh, I was running a club in Nottingham. It wasn't until uh, Justin started coming more on his own and Julie would not be around so much that uh, the penny started to drop with me and I, th I started to think, yes, probably, probably Justin could be a fully, a fully paid up member of my club. If he ever went off, it would normally only be with, uh, with a young guy for a one night stand. I could never believe that, that somebody would say he was homosexual. Most people, when they become famous, you know, there's rumours either he's a womaniser or he's gay or, you know. But that's part and parcel of the terrain. Brian was upset when he found that Justin was attending gay clubs. And I would have been. I would have been. Um, but I do feel, from the football point of view, that he was too scathing with Justin. Uh, Justin was a lad that... Um, really did uh, flower when you patted him on the back. He'd had another accident in his car and he came into my office and he sat down. He looked a bit dejected. I think he had a bit of a, a bad time with Brian Clough. And um, I looked him straight in the eyes and I said, Justin, I said, um, I think your life's in a little bit of a mess at the moment, isn't it? And he looked at me um, as if I dared to say anything about... Uh, uh, he, he, the way his life was uh, was going and uh, I said Justin I, I really think I know someone that can help you and he suddenly said who's that Till? Who's that? Who can help me? And I said I believe that Jesus Christ can help you Justin and he looked me straight in the eyes and said tell me more came along to church the following Sunday and uh, our church is a very sort of lively one, plenty of singing and plenty of activity, um, congregation of several hundreds, so there's plenty of atmosphere there. Um, Justin just lapped it up. He came to our house on many occasions and we became very good friends. He seemed to be like a, a ship uh, in a storm at sea, unable to uh, have any direction. I was in a situation where I'd met somebody who was a born-again Christian and he uh, enlightened me, if you want to use those terms, and I realised that there was something missing from my life. That he said that I could have a, a meaningful relationship with Christ. Justin said a prayer, a very simple prayer, about inviting Jesus into his own life. And something changed. And from that time, he was never the same person again. People out of this shape, all God, into the chaos of people's lives, we speak your word. There will come a I was talking to a young lad yesterday, and he said, whenever I see things about you, it's always fashion new. It's never God or anything like that. And I thought, he's right. I've been playing football for Justin Fashionu. And I thought that 
from now on, I'm going to play for him. I'm going to play to, to really please him. And for the young lad, if he's here, Andrew, you really blessed me yesterday. And um, when I'm scoring, because I really think I should do, I've been overdue, <laughs> overdue scoring. When I start scoring, it's going to be for God. So I just... That's me, and I, and I hope that I can go on from strength to strength. And Praise the Lord. Amen. His failings on the pitch and his deteriorating relationship with Brian Clough had a profound effect. In the summer of 1982, Justin left Nottingham in search of the father he had never met in Nigeria. It was something which I'd been thinking about, dreaming about for a long, long time, and I still really, I'm in the days, you know, I'm, uh, it's great. It's very difficult to meet a man that you, you've never met before, and suddenly he give you a cuddle and say, I'm your dad. There's mixed emotions. People have said your father abandoned yes. you in England. The way I look at that, I've said my father's come back to Nigeria. Now, the way that the press have said it, they said, well, he abandoned you. Now, I've never said that. I haven't had time to talk to my father about that, but I've never, ever said that. Unfortunately, the relationship didn't continue. From the day he went there was the last time I think he ever um, saw him again. Back in Nottingham for the start of the 1982 season, the summer break had done nothing to ease the tensions between Justin and Brian Clough. He felt his career was going to nosedive because once Brian Clough felt that Justin wasn't doing the kind of thing on the pitch that he felt he could do in his heyday, was obviously going to cause conflict, and it did. And uh, I know that they had a, a, a real bust-up in the dressing room. And um, Brian Clough said some very, very strong words to Justin with all the other players uh, in, the, in the dressing room. And Justin told him where to go in two short words. Matters came to a head one Tuesday morning when Fashionu, who was now suspended because of his continued disagreements with his manager, turned up at the training ground. I've turned up to training to give it a try because I feel that I've got to try and go to training because if I don't train I'm going to lose fitness which is going to put me back a long way and um, I was still under suspension and um, two policemen evicted me from the pitch. I pulled two coppers onto a, a training pitch to remove Justin Fashionio. The copper came across and he said, Brian, he said, we can't get him off here. I said, well, it I said, well, I'll kick his ball and you'll get him off. And so I got rid of him. And Brian Clough was as good as his word. Less than 18 months after becoming the first million-pound black footballer, Justin Fashionu was transferred across Nottingham to Forrest's local rivals for just £120,000. But at his new club, there was a further decline in his fortunes. The knee injury... Uh, I started off uh, something, a very small stud, which went into the knee. And it gradually got worse. And he was having a lot of problems with it. He spent the majority of his money searching for a miraculous cure for the knee, going all over the world looking for orthopaedic surgeons who would mend this knee. So most of his money went on that. It's cost me everything, really, so um, it's either going to be going back to playing soccer or being a road sweeper, one of the, <laughs> it's one of the two, but it's cost an awful lot of money. Following his injury, Justin drifted from club to club, both in Britain and the United States. His own decline was in marked contrast to the rising fortunes of his younger brother. By this time, I had now started to get a little bit of success, and as such, started to earn a little bit of money. Um, and was trying to support Justin the best way I could. Many times I'd get a telephone call and I'd have to transfer substantial sums of money to Justin. But Justin was draining my finances all the time because he was spending the money. Justin's lifestyle never changed. That was part of the problem. He still had the, the expensive watches and the expensive rings bought with the money that I transferred to him. He had left, he'd gone to America and he saw how successful I was. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I saw it. By yeah, then okay. I was playing with Wimbledon. 
opening companies, exploring business opportunities. And I think that he envied what I was doing, especially on the business front. Yeah. You're talking about ginger. The reason why I've had my uh, little bit of success is because I looked the way Justin did things, and I tried to correct the things that Justin did, the way he went about his lifestyle. We always saw the luxury he was surrounded by, and of course we always thought he'd prepared for the future and he was ready for everything, and you know, it wasn't the case. The castle was built of sand. Justin Fashionu was about to make headlines again. It was October 1990, nine years after stories of his private life had first surfaced. I was awoke in the middle of the night from a desperate, desperate, panicking Justin Fashionu. He was going to be exposed in a national Sunday newspaper about being gay, homosexual. He was also desperate for money. So I said, listen, let's call, you know, two birds with one stone. And I phoned up my friend Kelvin McKenzie at the Sun newspaper this early on in the week and told him that he would do his own story, confess he's gay, talk about other footballers and talk about, you know, people he knew, MPs, whatever. The day before the story was going to break, I think Justin plucked up courage to call me. And then he said to me, look, um, I'm gay, I'm a homosexual, um, and I'm going to release the story to The Sun, and it's um, going to be a big story. Being black and getting into trouble is a good enough story. Being black and gay it's Christmas. John's reaction was unbelievable. You know, I said, well, Eric, you've got to stop it because we're playing whoever Tottenham next Saturday. And can you imagine they'll be giving me wolf whistles and singing Charles, you know, John's brother is a puff. I said, well, I don't think they will, to be fair, John. But if they do, let them, you know, take, go to hell. So I said, look, the money you're being paid I believe, to my recollection, it was about eighty thousand pounds. So, you know, at the moment, I've got that. So let me give it to you. If it will mean you won't do the story, let me give you the money. I explained to him that Kelvin McKenzie at this stage ain't going to drop that story. I said, "We're too late. You're too late, Bubbler." You don't have to be a rocket scientist to realise what sort of impact that story would have in the black community and in the community at large, worldwide. I think in my own selfish way, I felt embarrassed. I'm from the macho world of football. I'm from where tough people, we're tough people. You know, I'm an African man. And I couldn't understand the fact that he was so unapologetic about it. I was blind with pain camera crew came to my training ground and they eventually got hold of me after chasing me everywhere and they did an interview and the interview was a very defensive very aggressive interview he's come out publicly and said his sexual preferences you know I mean what every footballer doesn't come out and say they like women they like men that's not they're nobody else's business so now he'll have to suffer the consequences which looking back now with that lovely word hindsight was wrong it was very silly it was very selfish of me. But I wouldn't like to, to play or even get changed in, in the vicinity. Of it. That's just the way I feel. So if I'm like that, I'm sure the rest of the footballers like that. It's disappointed me because I thought that he had more, more um, depth and more uh, kind of um, more about him than that. Because it, really, the, the, the more tolerance, I think, is the word. Because we've been through so much together, especially as kids, we've been through so much, that I think that it's disappointed me because I thought he was better than that. What made him do this? I would really like to know. I tried to contact Justin on several occasions. And the moment I, he took the receiver up and recognized my voice, down it went. And so he just severed all contact. The situation with my mother is that um, uh, I find that too painful for me to, um, 
to confront my mother at the moment. My whole reasoning and understanding of Justin changed. I then just became, I just then believed he was a liability to the family. In the aftermath of his disclosures to the Sun, Justin further tarnished his name by fabricating stories to sell to the tabloids. Once he even posed as a centerfold for a women's magazine. After a little while you didn't know which was true and which wasn't true. And he would tell you that, no, I'm never going to do any more stories like that again. Two weeks later there'd be another story. And you're having to put out more fires. Hearts have sacked their controversial striker, Justin Fashionu. It follows the footballer's admission that he'd been dealing with the newspaper about a fabricated sex scandal. The club said today that telling lies to gain financially amounted to conduct unbecoming a professional in any walk of life. Maybe I should have um, come out earlier and just denied everything, but I was in a situation where I thought that this was uh, easy money because people com were convinced that I was involved. I have never, ever had any sexual... And so, you know, from then on, our relationship became very strained to say the least. And the only forms of communication we had really was when Justin needed something. They wanted a little bit more in it, so we just made it up. Later in 1994, having ended his playing days in Britain, Justin Fashionu moved to the United States, where he turned to coaching. His plan was to make America his permanent home. The last time I saw Justin was earlier this year in America. We decided to go to a restaurant. And um, on our way back, we had a very, very long chat in his car. He was asking the question over and over again. Why did you send the two of us away? Just as simple as that. And every time I had the same answer for him. They were being looked after so well. They were well treated as part of the family. And in no way would I have been able to render that sort of treatment and facilities to them. I couldn't have done it. He didn't appear to understand. He gave me that sort of blank feeling as if it just, whatever I said to him, just went through him and never stayed with him. He didn't seem to accept it at all. I don't really know why. In February of this year, Justin Fashionu moved to a small town in Maryland to help set up a new soccer club. On the night of March the 24th, events here were to change his life forever. There was a party going on at Justin's house, and I got there about six, seven o'clock at night. And there was alcohol there, and there was also marijuana. I walked into the bedroom to call my girlfriend, Laura, and Justin followed me into the bedroom. And I was sitting on the edge of the bed, and Justin sat behind me. And while I was talking to Laura, Justin reached around me and started fondling me, and I quickly uh, told Laura that there was something wrong, I had to get off the phone. And I don't know if she ever said anything, but I hung up on her, got up, I turned around, and I told Justin that I wasn't gay, and I preferred women. Um, he said that he was sorry, nothing would happen again, can we let the night go on as it was? And I said it was fine with me. And I was having a good time, I, I'm not afraid to admit it and I didn't want to stay and keep partying. And we were still sitting there drinking, dancing, having a good time. Um, I was starting to get tired, but I was still drinking up until about midnight, a little after midnight when I fell asleep. I remember falling asleep on the couch. But the next thing I remember, is waking up in the bedroom with him. I woke up and I looked down. Oh, my clothing wasn't on me. Uh, and my clothing wasn't on me and Justin was performing oral sex on me. But earlier in the night, it was almost like a dream. 
I could remember seeing Justin behind me. And it seemed so much like a dream, I didn't even bother with it. I got my clothes and I just left. I didn't want to stay around, I didn't want to ask questions. Mom kept telling me that she thinks I better call the cops, or she better call the cops. I started kicking in more and more. Has he ever done it to anybody before? Has he, is he wanted? Justin was questioned by the police about the alleged assault and denied all knowledge of the accusations being made against him. He then left home, whereabouts unknown. But over the coming days, he contacted a chaplain he'd met, telling him his version of what had happened that night. He discussed his fear of prison, uh, his innocence, the fact that uh, he was being blackmailed. He said that they were together, intimately, sexually, and um, the next morning, uh, this individual asked for money um, in exchange for the evening they had together. And uh, Justin told me that his response was, you know, I don't have any money to give you. Um, uh, and at that point, uh, Justin said that the boy threatened him and he said, you know, if you don't give me something, I'm going to tell what happened. What do you say to accusations that you were trying to blackmail Justin? I don't exactly know where those came up from. I do know, yes, we hired a lawyer afterwards to protect ourselves, to pr protect myself. Um, I wanted a lawyer if anything happened up in court. That's the lawyer I wanted, but I never intended at any time to blackmail him. I never intended at any time to sue him. I just wanted justice to be served. Unbeknown to his family, Justin returned to Britain. He spent four days at Mount St. Bernard Abbey, a Catholic retreat in Leicestershire. He'd been there once before, years earlier, to pray when his knee injury threatened his footballing career. Justin phoned at the beginning of April. Uh, he didn't tell me who he was. He gave his name as Justin Lawrence. As soon as he came here, he, he immediately told me that uh, this wasn't his right name, told me who he was and why he'd come and so on. But I think there was just a bit of fear there that I suppose he didn't know who he was talking to and how much we knew about him and so on. And he was pretty desperate to come. I never had the sense of Justin that he was in any way condemnatory at all as regards the individual in the States and the accusations and so on. He seemed to be very understanding. But there's no doubt in my own mind that that was the sort of catalyst that, that had got him to this very sort of rock bottom. He was aware that he was a mixture of contradictions, really. Um, and there were sort of pulls in different directions. And to the fore of his mind was awareness that throughout his life there had been a conflict between his faith and his sexuality. He, he was struggling to, to come to some understanding and to know how he could move forward because he was so very aware that it, he hadn't dealt well with that in the past. In his own words, it had been a very destructive force in his life. I, I picked up quite strongly that he regretted quite a lot of the things in the past, that he'd been, he was very aware that he'd been given an awful lot and that he was a gifted person and, and he knew that, um, that he'd had a lot of opportunities and that he hadn't really always done things in the wisest of ways. And he recognized that John had perhaps been trying to save him from the wrong kind of publicity or so on. And perhaps he regretted that he'd, he'd gone along the road he had gone down and hadn't in fact sort of been guided. With hindsight, 
he was quite uh, upfront that he, he, he would do things differently if he had the time over. Justin left the Abbey on April the 18th. I encouraged him to come back to Maryland. I told him, Justin, how can you live your life on the run forever? If you are ultimately charged, you can't, you can't just run around the world forever. I mean, um, uh, so it seemed as though near the end that uh, he would probably make a decision about uh, coming back or something of that nature. Why didn't he call me? Possibly he became unable because of the fires I'd always put out for him. Maybe he thought that this, this one was too much. Justin had said in the past that the days of all this uh, controversial things he was doing was over and he just didn't want to do anything controversial to the family or bring the family down at all anymore. And he wanted to help the family. I just think this was his way of saying, look, no more. On May the 1st, Justin Fashionu hanged himself in a lock-up garage in London's East End. He'd found out that the police in Maryland had just issued a warrant for his arrest. The painful thing is always realizing that you're never gonna see your brother again. Whether you had close times with him, whether you didn't have close times with him. And in reality, I had no more battles with my brother than most people will have with their brothers. Most families have a few battles with their brother. Normally the brother they have the most fights with is the brother they love the most. This is the life. I miss my brother. I couldn't believe that he had the courage, really, to do that. And I kept asking, why, why, why? Why did he do it? And then eventually I heard and read the note that he had left as to the reason why he had done it. Well, if anyone finds this note, hopefully I won't be around to see it. But let's begin at the beginning. What a start. Everything going so well. Then I felt that I was abandoned, left alone, without anybody to turn to. Being gay and a personality is so hard. But everybody has it hard at the moment, so I can't complain about that. I want to say that I didn't sexually assault the young boy. He willingly had sex with me, and then the next day he asked for money. When I said no, he said, you wait and see. If that is the case, I hear you say, why did I run? Well, justice isn't always fair. I felt that I wouldn't get a fair trial because of my homosexuality. Silly thing, really. But you know what happens when you panic. The blood is from my wrists, cut because I want to die rather than put my friends and family through any more unhappiness. I wish that I was more of a good son, brother, uncle and friend. But I tried my best. This seems to be a really hard world. I hope the Jesus I love welcomes me home. I will at last find peace.